Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Beyond Talking Points with Matt and Matt. Um, we've never really reviewed a book before on this podcast. Um, we've, and basically, that's what we're going to be doing in the next uh, few episodes. Um, Michael Malice, um, uh, my co host's uh, god, um, if you will. Um, <laughs> that's a provocative statement. I, I retract it, but but, but uh, my friend here is, is a fan of Michael Malice, um, and Michael Malice um, has released a, a book, which is a collection of anarchist um, writings. It's just excerpts from uh, the writings of famous anarchists um, all across the political spectrum, um, and we just wanted to talk about that. Um, my friend, of course, is an ANCAP, so he is an anarchist of sorts, uh, what, do you, what I guess you could say a... a a right-wing anarchist or um, um, uh, li uh, someone on the libertarian-ish end, but obviously um, <laughs> not a libertarian that wants a government at all. Um, but that's that's actually a good starting point before we dive into chapter one, um, because anarchism um, is so broad <laughs> that w w when you're talking about it, you have to be very clear what kind of anarchism you're talking about. Um, so Michael Malice, for example, um, is an anarchist, um, but he's not an anarchist in the same way that, um, say, uh, Mikhail um, Bakunin um, was an anarchist. Um, but Bakunin was a collectivist. Bakunin was uh, a, a socialist. Um, and that there, there will be thinkers in this book um, who were more on the socialistic end. In fact, I think even um, William Godman, Godwin, excuse me, who uh, we'll be talking about in this episode, was more on the left than the right, um, if you look at it through that dichotomy. Um, so this itself, that itself uh, makes a very interesting conversations because um, all anarchists agree that they don't want a state, but they don't, that doesn't mean they agree on what they want to replace the state with. That they just agree that the state um, is illegitimate. Um, I'm very, I'm very torn, I guess, in some at some level, um, because I sort of, in my heart of hearts, am very, I'm sympathetic to the anarchist uh, school of thought. Um, I'm. I'm I'm sympathetic to the idea, for example, that the government should not in and of itself be trusted. Like, like, like we shouldn't just assume the government's right about everything because it's the government. Um, like I, I, I am for this idea that gov that authority um, in, in any, well, and, and actually that's to, to broaden that out, excuse me. Um, not only am I critical of like, uh, or not only do I believe that we shouldn't just trust the government, I don't think we should trust authority um, in general just because it's authority. I think we, and, and Chomsky, who's Noam Chomsky, um, another person we've talked about a lot in this podcast, he's a left-wing anarchist and he talks about this. Um, you know, authority needs to prove itself. Um, but then I, I, I worry that anarchists are, um, that, that, that their worldview um, is untenable in practice. I, I kind of feel like, um, or I, I'm, I'm, I have the suspicion that it could be untenable in practice. I, I, I like a lot of the ideas, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, they would be able to be implemented well politically. Um, you know, it's like an analogy might be, I would love to live in a world where war doesn't exist, um, but war is never going to go away, <laughs> um, in my opinion. Um, so it's, 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 I, I see anarchists as an important, um, I, I see their role in political discourse as important, uh, for the reasons I mentioned. Um, I just had, I just haven't been convinced of, um, that, that any anarchists offer an overall, um, uh, sy systematic, um, political philosophy. Um, but, but we'll get more into that at the, uh, near, near to, uh, the end of the episode. Um, I think, uh, 
I'll, yeah. I'll leave it there. Yeah, and um, to just give a little bit of background, one of the reasons why I kind of pitched this idea to Matt was I wanted to explore more text that we could actually comment on. So typically we'll watch a video, but, th but th this is actually like looking at some historic text from famous thinkers and then kind of evaluating some of the arguments they make while we both explore anarchy and also they think about our broad thoughts. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I was reading something that was um, kind of out of left field compared to some stuff we've discussed in the past. I know we, we, we've done an episode in the past on Chomsky and we honed in a lot on what makes a hierarchy, um, you know, more, 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 a hierarchy more legitimate than other hierarchies. And I, it was funny because I was evaluating that quote further and I found a lot of discussion about how Chomsky isn't even an anarchist because implicit in that statement is that some hierarchies are valid. And it left me in a funny situation because um, as, as our co-host knows and as anybody who's listened to some past episodes knows, I'm okay with certain types of um, or uh, certain types of consensual relationships that do involve hierarchies. So I was thinking, like, well, am I really an anarchist if I accept these th certain definitions? So one constant theme in this show, if anything's a constant theme, is it's hard to define words and it's hard to explore what words really mean. And th this gives us some chance to either rethink certain terms or rethink certain ideas through lenses of philosophers that aren't really super mainstream. And since I'm usually the ANCAP and my, my co-host who just refers to Chomsky a lot, um, it's a way for us to get out of only talking about really those two schools of thought. So we're, we're really gonna confront some other people. Um, now I do have to correct something my co-host said, we're not starting with chapter one, because chapter one is an introduction from Michael Miles, but we are jumping right into chapter two. And it's William Godwin, and it's from Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness from 1793. Um, if you actually have a copy of the Anarchist Handbook or are reading online or anything like that, M Michael Mouse does kind of give an intro paragraph where he kind of sums up what, what it is about broadly. But the, 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 this excerpt is on the social contract and it's discussing that idea. And that's something that we did some 40 episodes ago or so. We, we talked about it in broad strokes, but we're going to look at how William Godwin talked about it and some of the arguments he made against it and how legitimate we see those. So I'm gonna just kind of dive in and um, and I'm gonna bring up Godwin's first real objection to the idea of a social contract. Well, one of the things that I think is important in evaluating Godwin's work here is he is literally talking about the concept of a social contract and using that as justification for the necessity of a state. So it's not just this kind of abstract idea that we owe something to each other or that we owe something to society. He's really confronting it as if, if people, if certain philosophers claim that there is a contract we are implicitly agreeing to, he's pretty much saying that doesn't make sense. So, and I, I'm quoting William Godwin, he said, for whom did they consent for themselves only or for others? For how long a time is this contract to be considered as binding? If the consent of every individual be necessary, in what manner is that consent to be given? Is it to be tacit or declared in express terms? So I, I wanted to open the floor there because he's kind of raising a bunch of, um, it, it, it's somewhat general criticisms, but it's if we're supposed to look at this as an actual contract of sorts, why are there none of these contract qualities? Of really addressing that is um, by, by talking about some real types of contracts that mo mo most people who are listening to this probably experience in real life. So if you think about employment contracts, usually it's either for a defined amount of time or it's like at will, like you can opt out of that contract at any time. Um, it will directly define certain aspects of it and you have to usually sign something or show up to work for that contract to be valid. So there are these very tangible elements of it that don't seem present in a social contract. And that's part of the reason why he rejects the idea. Um, so that's kind of what we're, 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 where he opens with, and I'll let you jump in with maybe your reaction to that part of his argument. Yeah, so um, an issue that I, uh, uh, I, I've run into um, when we're talking about politics um, and just like, societal issues more broadly um there's like there's political theory but then there's kind of the way people behave in real time um so you know i, I can understand 
Um, John Locke, the Godwin Minson mentions um, John Locke, a very famous English political philosopher. Um, I can see like why he would um, make the why he would have like come up with the argument for the social contracts. He didn't quite he didn't create it, but he was one of the most well known proponents of it, um, along with Hobbes and Rousseau, those are really the, 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 the social contract trinity. Um, but my, I mean, my, my opening reaction, I guess, is related to that. Um, like, I, I, I want to find a way to, if possible, um, to take, uh, to, I want to find a way to look at political philosophy, but, but, um, you know, take what from it what you um, what you can that's applicable to um, the real world. Um, it can, I mean, thought experiments, um, you know, are, are can be very helpful, but then you get into very muddy territory um, because you're not looking at you're not looking at empirical data, or you're not observing the world as such. Um, you're not. Um, you know, at some level, you're, you're you're separated from reality. You're you're thinking about these things a priori, um, which could be a criticism of political philosophy, perhaps. Um, so the social contract, I guess, really is a way to understand why people um, consent to being governed, because the idea was that in in a state of nature, you have more freedom. Society constricts freedom. Most people would even right wing anarchists would agree with that society construct, const, uh, you know, prevents you from being as free as you could be. Um, so why would people um, not want to stay in that state of nature? Um, and that, that, that's what the that, that, that's what the social contract is attempting to uh, answer. So I, 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 I do, OK, so I disagree on the grounds that I don't think the social contract is attempting to answer something. I think it's attempting to justify. So I, I, I think the goal of the social contract is to, it's the its goal is to legitimize the state. It, it's to say, here are reasons why the government is legitimate. And it's because of the, this contract that exists between the, the people and the government. And I think, it, it, now, since we are talking about political philosophy and, and, and you do bring this up, it is an abstract thought. It's not a literal contract, but th th this is an argument that people who are statists use to argue that the state is a valid structure uh, on a philosophical grounds. So it needs to be treated with, with the philosophical argument. It's not attempting to explain how people act. It's more of a, th th this is grounding for the legitimacy of the state. And for, for that reason, w William Godwin, he takes that argument seriously. He says, if you're trying to say in a philosophical way that the state is legitimate because of this contract between the people and the state, here's why that analogy doesn't hold. So I, I, I think a lot of the reasons why, and, and this goes to our past conversation on the social contract, I, I think a lot of reasons why your intuitions might be unfavorable towards Godwin might be because you aren't observing the way the social contract was used as a political tool in political arguments. And I think that's something that needs to be emphasized because he's not really saying that he's more saying that this is how people argue the state is valid. And this argument does not hold any ground at all. If you're trying to be rigorous or intellectual about it, like it is not similar to any other contract because of all these reasons. So I understand what you're saying and I don't think you're wrong to say it. I just don't think that's related to Godwin's endeavor here. Um, and I think that has to be taken into account. Well, no, to, I mean, to be clear, um, no, I mean, I think we're both just, I think we're both um, right um, because yes, it, 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 it is used to justify state authority. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the original, uh, social contract theorists, what they were concerned about was um, the man's, um, th they were concerned with, you know, uh, why people would consent to 
that authority. So it's it's not it's it is not simply. Um, I mean, you could say it's a cynical tool used by leaders, um, but it, it is also a thought experiment, attempt, attempting to understand human history. But 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 to, to go back to my point about like the abstractness of political philosophy, um, that that can be easily applied in so when we're talking about social contract theory, because the 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 what you hear is well, I didn't sign a contract. Where is this contract? What are the you know terms of the contract? Can I get out of the contract? How long is this contract um, going to be uh, 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 in effect? Um, and of course, there is no literal, li literally written contract. I mean, it depends on who you look at. I think John Locke somewhere actually thought, yeah, no, people actually come together and write a contract. But most uh, social contract theorists realize that's absurd. Um, so it became a, no, no, it's an implicit thing. It's an implicit contract, um, related to communal, um, or re related to social cohesion, I suppose. Um, so. So, okay. So, 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 so one of the things you kind of said there, which, um, I, I just want to make sure I got right. And maybe I would need, need you to elaborate more on is, um, you, 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 you're talking about the origins of the social contract and you're kind of saying, people want to explore why people consent to be governed. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm, I'm willing to see that there are plenty of people who consent, who, who would be willing to explicitly c c consent to be governed if you ask them tomorrow. Um, now, I guess where I'm pushing back and that this is where Godwin pushes back is, he, I mean, I, I'm sure Godwin or I, I'm sure a lot of anarchists would, would make, make the argument that plenty of people are willing to, to submit to the government for whatever reason. Um, but now when we hear the social contract brought up, and I guess any type of modern context, it's usually somebody saying, I do not want to be involved with th this business. And someone pretty much says, you are obligated to due to your implicit consent. Um, now, now, Godwin's whole thing is, how did I implicitly consent is kind of the, it's, that's the next direction he goes. Um, and when people claim he implicitly consented, he kind of pushes back strongly against that. Um, so I guess, are you willing to, um, to are, are you willing to defend that the the kind of argument that people like myself and people like w William Godwin, even though we will tell you that we don't consent to the government, you we would say we still are consenting to the government. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that a correct assessment of what you're thinking? I have really yet to make any normative statements. Um, I'm I'm trying to. Uh understand um i guess the history of social contract theory it, it, it's a it's a purely um it's, it's almost like an anthropological or sociological question because or like and it kind of goes back to to the question of you know why were governments created in the first place um now i'm trying i'm not i, I don't want to uh, go down <laughs> any unnecessary rabbit holes um but you know there, there was a shift between um hunter gatherers uh, societies into agricultural societies, and then you know, people lived in larger, larger groups, which led to uh, more complex hierarchies, which ultimately led to governments. And so, uh, you know, there's a question, of course, as to why governments were created. But then um, there's a, then, then again, we're getting back to the two questions that we're talking about right now. Do, do, does the government have authority, um, and why would people be willing to? Uh, submit to that authority. Not everyone is willing to submit to that authority. Um, some people are. Um, so I, I can give you, I can give you my more, I, I guess, some opinions. I, I just don't want to give my opinions before I've kind of better. But I, I, I'm trying to to steal man, I guess, the social contract uh, argument based on what the original um, social contract theorists were doing i'm not defending or even criticizing it well, right now okay well one of the reasons why i guess i'm pushing back on even framing the discussion that way is because that's clearly not the goal of godwin's essay um I, I he he is um pretty much only addressing people who use the social contract as a tool to argue the government's legitimate um so i mean we you you and i we we, we, we we've been talking off air a lot lately on the ideas of why governments are so um, 
ubiquitous in history for, um, a, a lot of times in a lot of places and gr grappling with why that occurs and things like that. Um, now, in the vacuum of Godwin's piece here, that that's just, I, I don't see how it's relevant to the argument um, Godwin is deconstructing. So I'm kind of pushing back on even having that conversation right now and more leaning into if somebody is trying to use the argument about a social contract to say a government is therefore legitimate because of the, the, these um, po po political philosophy based arguments, here's what God meant when would it say to them and how do we feel about what God has to say? I, I'd rather go that direction with it if we're going to evaluate his piece, I think, properly. So the, I mean, I'm going to tie, I'm going to tie in what I have been saying with what uh, my, my response to, I guess, Godwin. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about all these things, which, um, uh, but they're, and, 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 and what I'm saying is not irrelevant because of what you or said earlier, which is the social contract theory is used to justify authority. And that authority usually is government. Um, it, but to, I can. Okay. Well, I, the, 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 I'm trying to draw the distinction between he, he's pretty much saying, Hey, here's how people argue that the government's legitimate. They argue that you consented to it already implicitly. Here's why you didn't implicitly consent to it. Here's why it doesn't work like any other contract. Now, you, you, you can argue that like, hey, it makes sense for government to occur for this reason. A lot of people make the same trade-offs. But that's not the same as saying, here's a type of contract that doesn't exist in the real world, but it makes sense on societal, on societal grounds. Um, that, that's why it seems like, it, it's almost like how um, you could talk to three different people about why they like basketball and they can give you three different reasons. And then you can criticize it. You can criticize one of the reasons and then you can someone be like, Hey, but what about this other ar ar argument for why somebody likes basketball? And it's like, well, that's true. There is that other argument, but he just, he's not deconstructing that one. That, I, I guess that's why I'm kind of just like, I don't think that's a good rabbit hole to go down. Social contract theory is, I think it's fair to say more on the collectivist end of the individualist collectivist spectrum. Um, so what, uh, I mean, and Godwin, I, I think, um, appears more to be an individualist anarchist. I mean, I don't know, obviously he was kind of one of the first anarchists, so that maybe it's not helpful to, to label him. Um, but I, I see him as asserting the individual against um, government authority, um, which claims um, to be an extension of communal authority, which is really what social contract theorists are saying. Um, to, uh, they're, they're saying that um, you would consent, you should consent to be governed because um, of what we've talked about before about humans being social animals and you need kind of the carpenter and, and the plumber and the mechanic and the doctor, you know, you need all these people in your lives or, or you need all these connections um, and have these different relationships in order to have the most fulfilling life. And so, you know, then it becomes a question of um, uh, people. Um, how do you, uh, how do people live in larger and larger groups? Um, and then the answer was for many thinkers throughout history, government. Um, that's not a defense of government. Again, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of bored. I guess I am kind of, <laughs> I am kind of, a. uh, um, you're in a time loop, dude. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm watching something happen in real time. I, that, I'm, that, buckling that, that down. I'm buckling, I, I'm buckling down. I'm buckling down on this background because I think it's really important. I, I, um, okay. um so, okay. So he, he, hear me out. I'm going to try reframing this in a different way. Um, it's uh, let's say it's not even about the, the 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 idea of the historical social contract, though. He he is saying that there is a group of people out there who say that he consented to some sort of agreement that makes all laws in his state binding to him. So he shows up and he's like, okay, well, what? There's this contract. 
then then who who did consent? Did did I consent? I don't remember consenting. How long does this last if I do consent? What are the actual rules of this contract? Is it binding for these current laws and the future laws? Like, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, is it, did, did, did I have to declare my official, you know, ruling on this when I turned 16 or do I get to change my mind at some point? Like, 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 like how does this thing function if there is a contract between myself and society that I've supposedly agreed to? That That's all he's positing. It doesn't matter. Okay. So I so 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 what what I what 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 what's your reaction to somebody saying okay people have been accusing me of agreeing to something that I don't remember agreeing to and I don't even think there are terms of a contract that could even arguably make sense I don't think they could be well defined I don't think any of this can be put put together in a coherent way even for me to decide if I want to agree to it or not um, how how would these rules even work it doesn't seem to make sense so. What, what, what's your reaction to that? The so this is why I'm I'm slightly hesitant to go along with anarchist thought. Um, in the same way that I'm hesitant in um, accepting, like say, libertarian free will and libertarian in, in the metaphysical sense, not the political sense. Um, the and, and it, I, I see anarchists as um, they seem to kind of uh, live in, or their, their thought process about the way people work, or the way communities work is a better way of putting it. Doesn't really jive with my um, understanding of things because I'm not sure consent. I'm not sure human co uh, collectives are really ever based on consent. Um, and that that might just be a necessity of human collectives. Um. So, okay. So, so, so kind of what I'm hearing is you reject the framing of Godwin's argument. To some degree, because I think, I think, uh, I think, uh, consent, I, I, I kind of, kind of the reason how I've said before, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, like we've had arguments before about the word authoritarian. And then I said in a episode not too long ago that, um, a certain degree of authoritarianism might be necessary. Um, that might be the same for what's the opposite of consent? Compulsion. Um, I, okay. I, I'm a certain to... degree of compulsion might be necessary in if if human collectives are going to be a thing. So okay, I I'm trying to um well let's work for it. I'm trying to break Godwin's arguments into pieces, right? I, I, I'm trying to kind of break them down and then we, we, we can go from point to point. And I, I think part of the reason why we're, we're, we're kind of struggling to have a conversation about it right now is because I think that there are two things simultaneously going on. I think you don't like Godwin's framing, but I also think that you don't like the argument that he's responding to. And because you don't really agree with what Godwin's saying, you don't really want to admit that he is, um, I guess, pushing back on an argument that you don't really like anyways in a way that is effective. And I think that would be a fair assessment to make if you felt that way. So I, I think Godwin is pushing back on a way of describing the social contract and the way some people use the social contract, but it's a way you wouldn't use the social contract. So I think that's why you're having a hard time with this piece. And I think that's why you're disappointed in Godwin's writing here. So Godwin is responding to a person who's making a particular particular argument. And you, you didn't make it in our past episode, which is why um, in episode 20, I believe, uh, on the social contract, I think we didn't really talk about it. We, we, we ended up talking about certain ideas that are related to the social contract, but we didn't talk about when people allude to it to us to um, close the door on consent. Now, now, now you know, you're kind of saying consent just doesn't matter. You, you're saying to, to some degree, I mean, it does matter to some degree, right? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you the I'm trying to give you due justice at some point. Like you're, you're not a Nazi. You, opinions have some way of expressing their beliefs. And you think to some degree, ideally, they'd be happy with their government. But you don't think that people need explicit consent from each individual for a government to be to, to, to be valid. Now, the way that some people get to your conclusion is by falling on this really poorly um, la la laid out philosophical example. And that is the social contract that Godwin is responding to. He's responding to a really bad argument that a lot of people actually do make. You don't make it, though. 
which is why talking to you about the sort of contract has historically been challenging for me. It's because you're actually not willing to defend the bad way people use it all the time. So in, you're, you're making points that are, 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 are tangentially related, right? And I'm willing to con concede that. But they actually aren't what he's talking about. He, th th there's a large contingency of people that I don't think you interact with a lot because you are of the taxationist theft type crowd. But if you're a member of the taxation is theft crowd, and he, a lot of times the reason why we have this strong anti-tax intuition is because our money is getting taken from us and we didn't explicitly agree to it. And if we were given the chance to, we would go out of our way and to, to say, we do not agree with that. And the reason why we don't do that right now is because if we say that and then don't pay taxes, we might get put in a cage or we might get shot by a cop. So we don't really... It's like we don't want to die, but we're only making this choice because of, you know, the proverbial gun to our head. So the way a lot of people just respond to this is saying, like, social contract, dude, you implicitly agreed to that. And it seems so absurd to people like me because it's like, no, I would do anything I could that didn't put my life or family in danger to, to go out of my way to say I don't consent. So Godwin's addressing that very poor. Argument. And I think you could you, you Matt, my, my, my co-host here could make a better argument, but it'd be a completely different argument. I think the social contract that he's critiquing is a very poor post hoc rationalization people say and believe in their hearts is philosophically grounded. But in reality, it's just kind of a post hoc rationalization that people kind of say because it reinforces their intuition that a state is legitimate. Now, you can believe the state is legitimate without believing this crappy argument. And that's why I think you're not really resonating with the conversation. Um, but that's kind of what I'm feeling right now. And I was kind of thinking that going into it a little bit too. Uh, well, if I may respond quickly, yeah. um, this is why, this is why people accuse um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, one of the social contract theorists of being a proto fascist, proto authoritarian type person, because um, I will, maybe I'm just repeating what you're saying in different words, but you know, if the social contract holds or um or if this if we believe the social contract then theoretically you could justify almost any government which is why i mean pe people talk about thomas hobbes and, and they look at the leviathan and think well what a crazy man he's just a, a he's a psychopath um in his thought process because he 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 uh did go to an extreme he said it doesn't matter what the government it does it doesn't matter who's in charge you need to um you need to, su to submit to uh, uh, authoritarian rule um, because if you didn't have that authoritarian rule, uh, you know, it would be chaos. Life would be uh, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, you wouldn't get your needs. Um, it would be a war against all um, or war f uh, for all <laughs> against all, um, which is why I brought up, you know, the, 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 the philosophers questioning the, you know, why people would leave the state of nature. Um, so, um, I, I, I see what Godwin's, I see the argument Godwin's attacking. Um, it, it is, it is the, it is, uh, using the social contract theory to, uh, 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 defend authority of any kind. Um, which of course is not what I'm saying. Um, it's not what I would defend. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. And, that, and that's, that, that's why I was, um. And that's why I thought it was kind of interesting to, to post his arguments to you, because I know you're not a defender of the way the, the social contract argument is, you know, used in common for, in common for, for vernacular. Because if somebody th throws out there that like, well, you have to do it because you implicitly consented like that, that's that's I think that's almost obvious how bad of an argument it is. And a lot of what William Godwin is um, is talking about here. Is just so some basic points against it, um, and I, I guess because I, I I don't think you're gonna have a ton of thoughts on it, I, um, I I'm just gonna I want to go through a few of his points he makes. But as I mentioned in the beginning, he's kind of going through how it doesn't really make sense as a contract, and a lot of that's because of how poorly defined it is. Then um, what could be construed as consent? So he talks about does me giving into the state count as consent, and then he talks about other comparable scenarios where nobody would call it consent if somebody just wasn't resisting. Um, and he's like, well, the, the, these things are never seen as consent in any other scenario. So why would me just acquiescing to government seem like consent? 
uh, it seems a little arbitrary and convenient. Um, and then he goes on to, 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 he gives a couple other examples where it's more of just like, when would you define this or, or when, when would you decide if you can, um, when, when would you decide you consent and are you ever allowed to change your mind? Things like that. It should be something that is simple. If it's uh, is this important, he also kind of points at something I bring up when we talk about democracy, but it's about how can people make these choices if they are expected to be making a claim about how they feel about all the laws in the country and all the potential future laws in the country. How is that something you can really even intellectually and philosophically consent to when, when, when you're consenting to something that is, um, you know, f futuristic in a way that you can't really contend with or even comprehend or, or know about. So, and then all of that, all of those questions are like kind of belied by the point that, and it's assumed that you already did agree and you don't have much recourse. So he, he pretty much uses this to hone in on he, here's the reason why the government's not legitimate and here's why the, the, this pushing back on it. Um, or, or pre, yeah, he, he uses this to, 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 to debunk this argument in favor of government legitimacy. And then he kind of says, so if somebody pushes back on you with this type of social contract garbage, it's nonsense because there's all these holes in comparing it to any real contract. Um, so we, I, I, I know you don't have that many super strong opinions on like literal what does consent mean in certain government related situations because those are almost those are almost like a whole other derailed um way, way, way of thinking about it but i i know you mentioned that you might not have a lot of thoughts on th this argument in particular so maybe we, we we can start bouncing into some meta thoughts we already started doing that anyways but we at least if somebody tuned in because they saw this is about Michael Miles's book and his section on um, Godwin. We, we, we at least need to say what it was about, <laughs> but, but I'm okay with exploring, exploring the other thoughts that this brings up in, in, in relationship to it, especially because I know that even though you're a person who can seem like a statist at times, you're not going to use that argument. So I, I understand why that's not as, um, I, I don't want to say personal, but, but, but you're not as invested in, I guess, the, in, the, in the, this specific argument. I'm not sure you're doing justice to my um, uh, my willingness to <laughs> hear Godwin out. Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I, um, so being the, so the conversation being as it may, um, I, I'm I'm very interested in um, you know the, the so the the idea as you mentioned um, about uh, people having various. Um, P individuals being very different and therefore how can they um, uh, come together um, as a group, as a collective, how can you agree on something? I mean, that, and I could read um, a little quote here. Did if I, I may. say that or did Godwin say that? Uh, you said that Godwin said that. And I was saying, I was agreeing that Godwin said that and I was going to cite the, the quote. Okay. Um, let's see. If you'd, if you demand my assent to any proposition, it is necessary that proposition should be stated simply and clearly. So numerous are the varieties of human understanding in all cases where it's independent and independence and integrity are sufficiently preserved that there is little chance of any two men coming to precise agreements about 10 successive propositions that are in their own nature open to debate. What then can be more absurd than to present to me the laws of England for 50 volumes folio and call upon me to give an honest and uninfluenced vote upon their contents. So like Godwin, you know, would say um, the issue with the government's authority um, is, I mean, to, to, to put it, uh, to go back to Rousseau, I guess, it's, it's, it's he's like, uh, he's attacking the idea of a general will. He's attacking the idea of a communal spirit or a communal authority that the government is an extension of um, because of how of the number of, of because there's so many uh, uh, differences in opinion and 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 uh, intellect and and just worldview of any given number of individuals in a collective, you can't have that authority. Um, now, he also cites Rousseau, um, who says uh, the great body of the people in whom the sovereign authority resides can neither delegate nor resign it. The essence, the essence of that authority is the general will and will cannot 
and will cannot be represented and must either be the same or another. There is no alternative. The deputies of the people cannot be as representatives. They are merely its attorneys. The laws which the community does not ratify in person are no laws, no nullities. Um, and I've said something similar when we've had conversations on the matter. I've said, well, yeah, I mean, at some point you have to, um, the, I guess, debate has to stop or dissent has to stop and you just have to implement policy. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're dis dissidents who don't agree with it. Um, the more people agree with it or disagree with it, um, or it's better, or it goes back to some communal authority, communal spirit, and therefore we're going to go through with this policy. Um, but I, I just want to be clear. I'm, I'm more than willing to, to, to take Godwin's arguments head on. Um, I'm, I'm sorry we got bogged down in, in uh, historical um, background, but I, I did think it was important. Um, but we can take the conversation in whatever direction you see fit. And um. well, well what, what, what thoughts do you have about those quotes you just read? Um, I, I think I know the, the, the direction you're going with it, um, but I don't think you wrapped up that thought. Oh, well, what I was, I mean, I was saying I, I've made some, I probably would agree more, or in the past, at least, I've agreed more with Rousseau um, on, on pragmatic grounds. Um, but this is kind of, <laughs> this is why, I mean, to, to go back to what I said in the very beginning, this is why I was saying there's a, I, I feel a disconnect between like a priori philosophical principles and real world application, because mm -hmm. th there are many, um, I, I can see value in, in um, uh, giving authority to the individual. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, I can see value in saying the individual should not be stamped out by the community. Um, and the individual should not be um, controlled by the community or the collective. Um, I, it's, at some level, I want to be an anarchist. I just haven't been convinced of anarchism. Um, I, I want to believe that um, Godwin's right about um, people not being able to, to, to uh, come to consensus, therefore um, government has no authority. Government has no authority. Um, but what I, when I look at history, again, I see people sidestepping that question. It's and, 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 and not really um, uh, allowing every individual to have his or her own authority, but certain people taking up that authority um, and in certain situations, imposing that authority on people who disagree with it. Okay, so I, I think there's two parts here to, to just kind of think about, or at, at least you're raising two thoughts um, in, in my head. Um, so the, 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 I have one thought on democracy and that, that, that goes to what Godwin's argument. And I have a second thought that's just about, I guess, history and power. Um, so we're just going to dwell on the first one for a little bit, and then we'll go, we can return to the other rabbit hole. So my, my thought is, um, and what, what, what Godwin is kind of raising there, and I, I think in this whole essay is really, my, my, my big takeaway is the absurdity of a lot of the core elements of democratic government, government or really government at all. But even the idea of democratic government is kind of absurd. It's um, a lot of people that we expect to agree or attempt to agree on a lot of things and give inputs on a lot of things that probably don't know anything about. Um, and then in the end, not everybody agrees, but it's still really their government, even though we institute something that a lot of people don't agree with. And one of the things that seems very, um, well, 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 it's arbitrary. It doesn't, it doesn't mean there's not okay reasons or ballpark reasons for why we do things in certain ways. But th there is a high level of, uh, I guess, arbitrary nature to, like, if you look at our our um, our government in the United States right now, and I know it's not a, it's not d direct democracy or anything like that, and, and it's it's a republic um, where we elect people and then they make decisions. But a lot of the thresholds are pretty arbitrary, and that, that's kind of what Godwin's reminded me of here, where it's like, well, okay, I, I know it's unlikely that if me and Matt got into a room with ninety eight more people who were similarly opinionated as us and as a, so similarly as disagreeable out there in terms of having some niche views as us, it's unlikely that there'd be a large consensus 
and a lot of consensus is really rel relative, but it's kind of um, crazy that some things can get put forth with like say 60% support um, or as opposed to 80%. Like it almost seems like the, the threshold for where, where it's okay to upset a certain amount of minority people is kind of arbitrary. And when you were reading that that first Godwin quote where it was about how can you um, expect, expect us to, and I'm paraphrasing, but expect us to agree with like one proposition and then the next 10, it's like, well, that, that, that is true. Like how often do I agree with even people who agree with me on most things on like 11 things in a row? And, and in the end, usually when we see something that is seen as, like when, when the media in the United States argues that something is almost universally supported, they're really talking about something being like 60% or 70% supported, where still three or four out of 10 people would, would push back on that policy. So the, the, there is a level of, um, when we're talking about consent, we're talking about how represented we are by governments, that is seemingly arbitrary. And like you can argue checks and balances reasons, you can argue stability reasons, you can argue consistency reasons why we use th certain thresholds. But it is hard to justify when we're talking about what rights mean and what philosophy means and what representation means. If you take away the, well, does it work though in real life part? It's like, well, it is hard to argue that these things are effective representations of people, especially in pretty simple hypotheticals. And I think that's kind of the virtue of what Godwin's bringing up here. Um, and at least that's why I find that part you brought up interesting. Um, so I'll get your reaction there before I go down another pit. Um, well, the, the funny thing, though, when we're, again, when we're talking about the, the broad brush of anarchism is, um, and I, probably Godwin would even be in this camp, um, that they, they are... It, uh, deeply rooted in the democratic tradition, they're, they're because they, and 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 his, I mean, and, and this is why it's um this concept of of sovereignty. Um, the an anarchist is saying, um, the the political power or the 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 the, the, the uh, moral authority, uh, the, the authority. That's the that's the word. I'm that's uh, will best uh, get my point across. The authority is in the people. Um, and so when I'm talking about, if I'm defending uh, dem democracy, um, I don't even have to defend, well, I know you weren't pleased with the stateless democracy episode, but I don't necessarily have to defend a government, quote unquote, to say that authority derives from, it, uh, from people. Authority doesn't derive from their rulers. It derives from the ruled. Um, so it's just, it's just interesting to me. I mean, you're, you're, well, I guess, I mean, the, the, the ANCAP then is an anarchist and they're accepting, you know, bits of the, the idea of bits of the democratic tradition. They're just rejecting democracy as a form of government. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a distinction that I think should be made. Um, at some level, we're both saying the authority derives from the pe pe authority derives from people. We're just uh, I've been I've been more inclined in the past to say, therefore, a certain form of government is OK. And then, and you would say, no, 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 no. Get rid of the government entirely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I and s since I noticed that we're like the 45 minute mark, I, I do think um it's about time for me to be really provocative because we have to have some provocative um, our arguments. And um, I, I, as you were saying that, I was thinking about how a lot of the views I champion are overwhelmingly democratic. I just think that the, the, the form of government that we would call democracy is painfully, it's painfully misleading um, in terms of, in terms of thinking about um, being democratic, because I think all of the things I actually preach in practice are much more democratic than anything that democratic governance even begins to approach. And it almost, um, I mean, if I was, if I'm going to give this weight to what, what I think being democratic means in a non-political context, it's a, it's a really d almost disgusting use of the word. Because if I'm talking about power deriving from people, I think every person can be the main champion of authority in their domicile. And I think they should have the ultimate power over all of their relationships and their life and go about it in that way. So I, I think when you're on your property, you make your own rules and you, we, we, when you decentralize things 
and this is just in common language, um, like having democratizing effects. So there's like this whole movement in like, you know, the last 30 years that's the democratization of technology and media. And this is seen as a good thing because we are decentralizing the power. Now everybody has access to do certain things, which could be as simple as putting your voice out there in the world and um, making more people informed on what you're doing, no matter what it is. And this is very powerful. And pretty much what my philosophy as a person who's essentially an anarcho-capitalist I'm, pre I'm presenting forward is saying, everybody needs to have the ultimate say over their own relationships. So it's like, as long as you um, are acting in a peaceful way and acting in a voluntary way, you can do anything you want. And I, I'm saying you are the master of your domicile. So instead of saying, I want a government, I am saying I want every individual to be their own sovereign, right? This is the epitome of the idea of de de democracy. It's just not what political democracy is seen as. What political democracy is, is a majority of people say a certain thing, and that thing is applied to everybody. I see that as disenfranchising everybody who lost in that vote, or everybody who voted for somebody they don't even really like anyways, because it was a better alternative. I think that's almost the antithesis of what I think um, any of the positive movements that have decentralized and democratized like a resource or a technology are. Um, that in, in reality, that's really centralizing power in the name of democracy instead of just decentralizing power, which is the most democratic way to use power. Um, so I, I would push back in that, to, in, in that way and to that extent. But, but I think the core of what you're saying is right, where I am taking elements of democracy and I am completely overtly in every way re rejecting political democracy in the way it's framed in the Western countries. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm with that characterization. I'm fine with that. Well, and, and to be clear, um, I do think we should, uh, so intro or political sci 101 guys. Um, of course the, the, what you hear when you, especially, uh, so you and I are both American, American, uh, in quotes. Um, yeah, so uh, America is a Republic, um, which you could say is a democracy one step removed because, you know, republics are about, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to choose a representative to do all the, you know, vote on all the laws and all that stuff for me. So I don't have to do that. Um, whereas if you take a, if you look at democracy, what it meant in the original sense, like in, in, in ancient Athens, um, it was literally the citizens of ancient Athens met and voted on every single law. Um, so that going, so that's why I was saying like, I can defend that, um, democracy in its pure form without necessarily defending government. Yeah. Um, but, but, but you recognize that what I'm saying is also a critique of any direct democracy too. Like, 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 like I'm not singling out a republic. I'm saying even the idea of a direct democracy, I think is antithetical to the idea of democratizing technology or democratizing media or g g giving people power, I think isn't what democratic governance does. I think that's almost the opposite because it you you're you're giving away power because other people can take away your stuff even if you don't like it now. If if you had your ultimate power, you would get to make all your own choices. And by all your own choices, I mean you can voluntarily agree to any agreement another party also voluntarily agrees to. And that is the ultimate level of empowering the sovereign individual. And that is truly decentralizing and democratizing the power. Democratic governance takes that away, and it, you're, you're, if you consented to it hypothetically, you'd be giving up a lot of power to the collective majority vote, hypothetically. Um, I don't think that is really democratic in a small d way, because it's, it's taking away the power from the individual, giving it to the collective body, hypothetically made of the individuals, but you could just have each person as empowered as possible on their own, and then they wouldn't have to give up that power. Um, so, so I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think democratic governance is actually empowering. And I think empowering people the most is actually not through democratic governance. And that's why I'm kind of, I'm pointing at, it doesn't matter if it's the Republic I'm criticizing or not. I think that applies to even direct democracies if they were to exist. Uh, well, I don't know where, how, where, uh, where you want the conversation to go, but I'm going to say something. 
which is related to um, just my, my overall suspicion of, of anarchism. Um, so I said earlier, consent is, or like society is not based on consent. Um, so I'll say something else uh, equally um, outrageous to you. Um, society is built on disenfranchisement. <laughs> um, in, in other words, um, and maybe this is why you disagree with my the, the historical analysis I was giving or the, the historical background I was giving because um, I do think that um, collect, uh, human collectives um, inherently require, or I suspect they probably require a certain degree of um, of freedom. Your, your freedom is taken away to a certain degree, and um, I, I think that would even that would probably. Hmm. Well, I was going to say it could even be true in Ancapistan, um, but I would have to think more about that example. Um, e see, 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 so what I'm trying to say is, if if, if I, I don't know. I, if anyone takes one thing away from this episode, and I know this is a common point, so I'm not, I, this isn't original, this isn't profound, but I'm really worried that anarchists are living in a fa fantasy land, um, which makes sense. Uh, it, it might make sense uh, based on, like, like anarchism might be internally logical or internally consistent, but that doesn't necessarily make it the correct political ideology to follow. Um, I, 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 that's why, so I'm really hoping with this series we're doing um, that it, it is about um, yeah, tr exploring anarchism more deeply so I can see if my suspicion is, or is, is correct or if I'm simply misunderstanding anarchism um, and I need to reevaluate. Uh, well, okay. Um... Thing. I, I have to be careful. I have to be diplomatic here because, um, well, okay. So part of me, here's how I react to you saying that. And I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you because we've done 60 episodes. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to tell you what I think. Rip but the bandaid off, man. Yeah. Yeah. But it, the, 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 the anarchist handbook that, that, that we are going to explore, the, the, the goal isn't to tell you this is how anarchism works. And in the intro, my, my, Michael Malice says, this book is about the flavors of anarchism and the, well, well, okay. So you, you can look at why anarchism, um, why people come to certain philosophical thoughts without them positing their theory on how life would work without a government. He, he open he opens with saying, that's not the goal of this book. If you want to have that conversation, then we should read a Cato and Stu book, which is a minarchist book. That would that that would be very very pro decentralizing the government. And if you're going to look for something that attempts to answer your questions, those are a place to start because they're at least rigorous. Or we'd look at other thinkers like we would read something by Rothbard and Mises. The goal the goal of reading these isn't to say here here's the future without government. The goal is saying here's what rebellious thinkers in their generations have thought. And a lot of their work is about why conventional reasons that justify government aren't valid. And so I, I guess what I'm getting at is the, these texts aren't going to tell you, hey, a government isn't actually necessary because that's not what most of these thinkers are arguing. A lot of them li lived in times where the government was just very, very outrageous, um, treated them poorly, and then they're, they're reacting to it. And then a lot of their writings are on philosophical grounds. So I, I think the big takeaway from this episode is at least not to be trying to posit the theory on why government would work anyways. I, I think if you want that, then you should be exploring things that are like Austrian economics or something of that sort. This is an Austrian economics text. Um, I think the takeaway, and I, I, I took this from chapter one when Michael Malice did this intro, but he said, in one sense, anarchism is nothing more than the declaration that, quote, you do not speak for me. And th this is really how other people come to the idea that like what we call a government, even democratic governments, aren't free in the sense that other people are saying, hey, here, I, I am, I'm doing this in service of you. And you're saying, I didn't want you to do that. I don't want anything to do with you. Get away from me because you're making my life worse. You're harming me. You're harming other people. And it's like, I, I do not respect you and I don't want anything to do with you. That, that, that is kind of the essence of a lot of these anarchist thinkers. 
So it's it's less about them being people who have, are doing studies that with citations. It's more of them saying, how did they come to that thought? And if we want to have the conversation that works, then we can we, we, we can talk about rigorous texts, but that's not going to be the, these texts. So if that's the answer that you're kind of, and I know by conversations you've conversations you've been kind of, I guess, fixated on to some degree lately, we'd have to explore some other things. I'm more interested in this right now because I know that I have a brand of anarchism that isn't historically popular with other anarchists because a lot of anarchism arrives from, like, say, a lot of labor movements. I'm not sympathetic to labor movements really at all for the most part. So I want to hear them out and give them the devil. I, I want to give those people their due. Um, and it's more of just exploring those ideas in a free way than looking for the, um, the you know, the, a, a silver bullet or something of that sort. Cause I just don't think we're going to, we're going to stumble upon that conveniently from, you know, so somebody like Godwin or Bakunin or, or, or that sort, it's more of just re wrestling with the political philosophy that is somewhat arbitrary at times, but some arguments are still going to be better than others. And some are going to have more weight than others. And you can examine them in a way that is, I guess, um, is compelling. So, so I hope that, I hope that's what we do get going forward. Um, so this, this episode is very interesting to me, um, from a psychological standpoint, uh, <laughs> I'm making a bad joke, but, um, no, I, I think, I think we were talking past each other there because what I was trying to say was, um, or what, the, what I'm trying to get across is, um, I'm not expecting Godwin or Sterner or Bakunin or, or Emma Goldman or anybody, um, to give me. Uh, truth with a capital T. <laughs> not expecting the the the. Uh, I was going to use a bad expression. I, I'm not expecting a total solution um, to all of society's ills that are going to create a utopia if you just get rid of government. And these are a thousand reasons why. Um, what I am saying is, um, I think political philosophy does need to justify itself on practical grounds. Um, and you can start with the theory, you can start with the, um, the philosophy, um, and that's fine, and I'm very at home in that arena. Um, but then you have to get past the philosophy and apply your ideas. Um, and that's, of course, I mean, and I, it's funny to me at some level that I'm saying this because this is kind of what conservatives uh, scream about when they're talking about liberals, right? It's like, oh, you crazy liberals, you have this idea of, uh, what's an idea? Uh, I can't think of an idea off the top of my head, but some insert some idea that, you know, liberal thinkers have, have talked about. Or, or John Rawls, a person you're not sympathetic to. You know, his, his sole thought experiment about, um, uh, you know, create a society where you don't know if you're going to be uh, 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 the poorest of the poor or the richest of the rich. Richest of the rich. He's kind of a, a liberal. He, he was in that uh, liberal tradition. Um, and the conservative might say, oh, you know, these, these liberals, they're just in their fantasy land with all their airy philosophy, and it doesn't apply to the real world. And that's why conservatives are like, well, okay, you need tradition, you need religion, because these things apply to the real world. Don't talk about human, don't talk about abstract rights, talk about um, why, uh, you know, the nuclear family is important for social stability. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is the conservatives are right to uh, to request um, pra practicality and and pragmatism, um, and so I am hoping I'm, I'm maybe not from this book. You could be right about that, but I am hoping that this could be um, this this book is the beginning of a, a, a greater exploration of anarchism, and maybe the ideas will lead to um, uh, application, and maybe I'll be. If, if, if the ideas um, jive with me, maybe I'll, uh, you know, understand the application. Um, so I, I, I'm, tr I'm open to changing my mind. I'm open to saying, yes, in fact, you're right. Anarchism is the way to go. Um, and that's why I agree to do these, to, to review this book um, in the first place. Got it. Um do you have any other takeaways for, for, from this chapter before we wrap up? Are there any other broad, I guess, things that brought up for you? 
Uh, I don't... I mean, he makes other points we haven't really talked about. Um, but I, 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 I think that's... About, I think I've covered all the, the main stuff I needed to get out of my system. Got it. Well, I, I guess if I was going to summarize this episode, I would say uh, something along the lines of anybody who appeals to the social contract um, is making a very poor argument. And even if you... Th I don't think it's... Um, I, I, I think Godwin does a good job of just kind of showing how arbitrary and silly that argument really is. So if anybody wants to read it, it is very brief. Um, earlier in the show, we, 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 we read off what it was an ex excerpt from. Um, and as far as I picked up in our conversation, I, I, I could be missing something, but, but you didn't really defend the argument. He's attacking either. So I think we have somewhat unanimous agreement that he, that, that is at least a poor justification for implying that somebody consented to being governed. Now, what, 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 whether people acquiesce to the government is another question. And God, Godwin admits that he admits that people acquiesce to it, but it, it, I, I, I've always hated that argument and it seems like such a, poor way of um and and it is a philosophical question and that, that's why i'm not really engaging on the other end at least in the context of this conversation um but 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 it seems to me everything that he's pushing back on is a valid point if someone was to tell you you implicitly consented to a contract to be here um people could try to point to other justifications and th those ones might be a lot better but that typical i guess saying that is cliche doesn't really hold any water and he pretty much takes it apart piece by piece um so i i would definitely recommend people check that out and that that's in chapter two of the anarchist handbook um i know i just said that so a lot last thoughts from you and we'll wrap up i actually want to make a, a meta point um not specifically about godwin's um the, the excerpt from godwin um but politics um, and philosophy and, and, you know, your core values, um, it, it can be very hard uh, to have these conversations. And I think this, this episode is a particular example of two people struggling to properly engage. Um, but I, I think we do as good of a job as our um, uh, skill sets um, allow. Um, and we always go into, into this with, uh, you know, a, a, a positive, not a positive attitude, but uh, uh, a, a attitude of, um, I guess, openness. You know, we're, we're willing to hear the other person out um, as long as we <laughs> have our say. Um, so I, I, I'm glad we talked about this. Um, as with many conversations we have, I'm not always satisfied with them, but I'm always satisfied if not with the conversations, at least with uh, the fact that the conversations forced me to think uh, on the spot about um, the questions that are most important to mankind. Um, and if anybody listened to the, all the way to the end, I hope uh, it did the same for you. And if anybody wants to check out other conversations that generally more and more, um, I guess, on the same page, you can find those at Beyond Talking Points, either on any podcatcher or on YouTube. Next week, we should be talking about, or we plan to talk about Max Sterner, which is chapter three from that book. And he is much more, I guess, acclaimed and discussed and controversial. So there will probably be more to dig in there without getting, I guess, derailed in, in the ways that we got derailed in this episode. Um, you can find more content on YouTube by going to the Antsy Philosopher for more of Matt stuff. And I post sometimes on the Obey podcast, which you can find on YouTube or on podcast feeds. And that's more about contemporary politics. Um, but for now, until next week, sign off is Matt and Matt. Thank you.